Welcome to the Jack Weston MCAT Podcast with your host, Phil Hawkins. And Asai Calderon Muñiz. Alrighty, welcome back to another episode. We are excited to be back and talk about some new topics for you guys and with you guys. So today we are going to be talking about all things ideal. This is going to be a fluffy podcast all about an <laughs> ideal world and just ideal studying and ideal med school, if only. Instead, we're going to be talking about ideal gases. And because Unfortunately, not all is ideal. We'll also talk a little bit about exceptions to the ideal gas law. So essentially, we're going to be talking about how gases behave and how they behave if you don't have real life situations and then what actually happens in real life. And we'll try and, you know, go through some some examples. Um, but there are so many ways that the MCAT can test us on this. And it's not all ideal. OK, I'll stop. <laughs> Um, they can test us in a lot of ways with this. So with the ideal gas law, you are you have pressure, you have volume, you have temperature, you have the number of molecules, you know, in this container of gas that you have. And they can absolutely test you on curves, on ways that pressure and volume, for example, interact and respond to one another. And this is huge because we've talked a lot about content, right? And just the facts that are involved, the relationships, but we really haven't talked much about data interpretation on our podcast or even really, you know, the types of graph students can see, but this is a place where there can be a graph to this. And so making sure that you're comfortable with that um, will be important, but still understanding the concept behind that is what really matters. You're able to, you know, apply it to to data interpretation when you understand the fundamental relationship, in this case, between pressure and volume. They can also test you on the heart, right? Um, and the relationship between, um, just like, your heart is a pump, <laughs> um, but just the different relationships there, it can test you with the relationships um, with work, right? And so there's so much going on with ideal gases it's to ripe for questions. And it's something that I don't know about you, Phil, but I, well, maybe not you, but I definitely left towards the end of my studying. I was like, oh, I know about gases. And then I realized that there were equations I had to memorize and a little bit more than just, oh yeah, these are gases, right? I know the diatomic gases. In case you don't know the diatomic gases, Brinkelhoff, essentially bromine, um, uh, iodine, nitrogen, chlorine, uh, Hydrogen, oxygen, fluorine. And so it's just like Brinklehoff. It's an easier way to remember it. Um, but that's all I really remembered from Gen Chem until, you know, I sat down and studied for the MCAT. I was like, oh, there's more I need to remember. <laughs> yeah. I, I, first off, I, I wasn't sure how you were going to start the session. You're like, oh, we're going to talk about all things. I'm like, is she going to say gassy? That's weird. <laughs> Um, but no, all things ideal. That, that, that was a way better intro than what I would have done for that. <laughs> um, but yeah, like pressure volume loops. Um, actually we've never talked about this as I, um, but that was one of my favorite parts of med school. It's like understanding pressure volume <laughs> loops in cardiology. And, <laughs> but I think it's the physics, it's, it's physics. There's physics involved there. And I'm like, yeah. Um, but this is something you will need to, as a physician, be able to like look at a pressure volume loop and see like, okay, what's going on with this patient? Um, like, do they have like aortic regurgitation? Do they have a mitral stenosis? Like what's going on with this just kind of overall? Um, and so this like understanding kind of the basics of this, like obviously that's a little bit different because blood is not a gas, but understanding gases helps you apply it to the, like the same ideas to this. And obviously also, um, the like pulmonology like that's that's even closer um to the gas stuff and that's something you absolutely need to understand um i also like your brinkelhoff um i've, I've heard a bunch of different ways to remember those diatomic gases um i want to like just reiterate to students like you really need to pay attention to that because the mcat can set set up like a tricky question where they will say that you know you have uh, one mole of oxygen gas and it reacts blah 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 and mm -hmm. you need to know that that's o2 and not just o by itself like it's a diatomic gas it's found like two atoms are stuck together and the same thing for chlorine nitrogen iodine all the other ones um so the the other mnemonic that i've heard a lot is have no fear of ice cold beer um 
which is a good one. Um, I kind of like, I call, I, this is one I made up. So this one's probably not as memorable uh, to other people, but it sticks in my mind. I just remember it's the rule of seven. So there are seven diatomic gases, including hydrogen. Um, everyone knows hydrogen. This is part of it. Everybody knows hydrogen. And then you go to the periodic table and you go to element number seven and you make a seven. So element number seven is nitrogen. And then if you go over and down um, and you like draw out a seven in the periodic table, that's uh, nitrogen, oxygen, chlorine, or fluorine, chlorine, iodine, and bromine. Um, and so it's it's all of them. Since you have a periodic table on test day, I'm like, oh, I'll just like memorize. Oh, it's like a seven. You go to number seven, you make a seven. And there's seven total, of course, because everyone knows hydrogen. <laughs> um, I like that. That's pretty yeah. cool. But um, yeah, I, I would agree. I think that this like all kind of like fits together. We should we should take a second though and talk about like what is an ideal gas because like I think most everyone of who's listening to this has probably heard of the ideal gas and ideal gas laws at some point. But just kind of understanding what makes a gas ideal and what are the assumptions inherent in that and like when things might not be ideal is also pretty important in that. So. Looking at um, looking at ideal gases, right? So they the one of the big things is this kinetic theory of gases. So when we picture a gas in our head, right? Most of us kind of like maybe it's hard to picture a gas because most of us think of air and like it's not really a thing. But if you like zoom in and kind of expand this, like I always like to think about gases as just like tennis balls just bouncing around all over the place, right? And there's there's lots of space between them, which is why like you can compress a gas. Like you can just like push all the, the tennis balls closer together and you can like expand it and like let them bounce even farther apart. But we like to pretend that these um, we like to pretend that these gases are um, like they, they collide in a elastic manner, right? So they don't like hit each other and deform or anything like that. They're these like perfect frictionless elastic collisions where they just bounce off of each other all the time. Um, just a side note into this, like this is actually a really good way of understanding gases. Just picture them as like little things kind of whizzing around. And um, like temperature, like when you raise the temperature of a gas, like what's actually happening at an atomic level is things are moving faster. And this is actually like the science. This isn't just like a way to picture this. This is what happens with a solid, a liquid, a gas. Warmer just means it's jiggling more, like the atoms are jiggling more. And so um, we actually know that like raising the temperature of a gas just makes the molecules move faster. And so they're bouncing off the walls even faster, kind of going through this all over. But because these things like gases, like atoms are so tiny and molecules are so tiny, like we, we can pre essentially pretend it's just a point and they don't actually have volume. In real life, like the, the atoms themselves do have volumes, but for the ideal gas, like assumptions, we assume that they have no volume. Now, like that's that's not strictly true. Like if you had a gymnasium full of gas, using the ideal gas equation, like which is PV equals nRT, we'll talk more about that here in a second. But the idea is that if I double the pressure, I could sh like I could shrink the volume in half. And then I could double the pressure and shrink the volume in half again. I could double the pressure and shrink the volume in half. And I could do this forever. This, this equation doesn't have a limit to this. But in real life, obviously, like those atoms take up space. So there's going to be some point where all the atoms are like touching each other. And I can't compress that anymore. The ideal gas law, the ideal gas equations, like don't like assume that everything is like a point and they can't, they take up no volume. So the idea of ideal gas law is good in some cases and in most cases it's really useful, but it's important to understand that that's an assumption that is inherent in this, that these like atoms and molecules have no volume itself um, and that there's no difference between like a giant molecule of glucose that's in the air and then just a single hydrogen in the air. Like they, they're the same size, which is no size at all. Um, they're just a single point. Um, now, obviously that's not exactly true. Uh, yeah, I like this idea of like a giant gymnasium 
Um, and I think one thing that helps me to remember that is even if, even if you don't think of, because I know for me, it was pretty hard to, and it still kind of is to conceptualize this tiny little floating, virtually non-existent um, molecule. And so I think if you think about this, even if you had a ton of people, right, let's say you had like 10 people in, in this giant gymnasium, when you guys are spread out, it's like you have no volume, right? Because you are so far apart from one another that it, the tiny bit of volume that you have compared to this huge gym with, you know, really spread out from other people is non-contributory. But then if you put people in a smaller space, right, and there's more pressure, um, then yeah, that volume actually matters, right? And so that was one way that I conceptualized it because again, this there are some things that are abstract that I can picture for whatever reason, gases. I try my best and we just, we don't always get along. It's it's hard for me to picture it. Um, yeah. Give me a I, car's I, passage to visualize any day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm totally the opposite. I, I do like that idea of like people in a gymnasium, like the size of the gymnasium has pretty much no effect on the size of the people. In mm -hmm. theory, you could like shrink that gymnasium to half the size and like still fine. Um, it gets a little gruesome if you keep cutting the room in half and like all of a sudden, like like the 10 people are getting smashed and squished and like, well, so the volume of the people actually stops us from shrinking this room anymore. It's kind of the same thing with gases um, where we assume that the gases have no volume at all, um, which works most of the time because most of a gas is empty space between the molecules, which are all kind of like whizzing around all over the place. Yeah. Another really important um, just like requirement of, of the ideal gas law is that these gas particles don't really interact with one another, meaning they're not attracted to one another. They don't repel one another. So oftentimes in chemistry, we're thinking about how different molecules interact with one another, right? We're always looking for them to, you know, have some kind of attraction. We think about different types of bonds and we're thinking about, okay, um, you know, what, what's, how much does a, uh, uh, atom want to pull on an electron, right? Things like that. But we can't with the ideal gas law. Because if you think about it, you know, like you said, there are all these tennis balls whizzing around. But if tennis ball A actually wants to go to tennis ball B, then it's not just whizzing around, right? It's being pulled in a direction. And that's going to upset the 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 system, right? It's no longer ideal. Um, and so like you were saying earlier, you know, temperature matters. So when you have a high temperature, right, you're whizzing around and you're just bouncing from one side to the other. Um, but similar and, you know, you think about your daily life. And again, for whatever reason, people help me help me understand the, the gases. Um, if you're running from class A, your morning class to your afternoon class, if you see a friend, you might say hi, but you're not stopping to have a whole conversation with that friend right? You might not even notice them because you are literally running across campus. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's happened to y'all. It may or may not have happened to me. Up to you <laughs> to decide. Um, but then if the temperature is lower, right? And again, analogy being you have an hour to get to class, then these intermolecular forces are going to matter more, right? It's like, I'm I'm relaxed. I'm cruising my way to my next class. I might stop and I see my friend. We're going to stop and we're going to have a 20 minute conversation. Right. And so it's really similar with um, with the gases, because now they're not just whizzing past one another. They're moving slower. And these forces that would cause them to interact with one another and no longer be ideal are more at play. Again, the actual ideal gas law itself does not account for this. Right. This is the real life um exception scenario. But it's really important to understand these because the same way they can test you on the ideal gas law itself, they can also test you on the exceptions. And so it's important to be aware of both and when the ideal gas law starts breaking apart. And yeah, I, I think it's it's also really interesting that like the thing with these like intermolecular forces like they don't have to be attractive they could also be repulsive yep. and like that also affects these things and i was just like thinking like in your analogy like oh you're running to class but you see like your ex which you're <laughs> trying to avoid and like all of a sudden you're trying to i'm going to take a different path because you've got time and you're not sprinting um so, so repulsive forces also factor into this 
So what I'm fear hearing from this is moral of the story. Don't date someone in your undergrad class. <laughs> or don't be late because you may need to take alternate routes. Uh, I like that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the, I, I just kind of wanted, sorry. I want to kind of like, like understand pressure a little bit. Because I feel like students misunderstand pressure a little bit with, like, so what pressure actually is, like, if we imagine this big gymnasium full of, like, whizzing around tennis balls, your pressure is actually just measuring how many tennis balls are hitting that wall. Now, obviously, the faster they're going, the harder they're hitting that wall. And so that's why when you raise the temperature, pressures go up because the higher temperatures means things are moving faster. And so, like, we have this, like, kind of, like, slamming into walls of things. And so I always like to think, like, if all of these molecules we're attracting each other like all the molecules want to be close together then they're going to be hitting the walls less because they're being pulled towards the center where the rest of the balls and if they're all being repelled by each other then they're going to be hitting the walls more and so the ideal gas equation has nothing to do with those like intermolecular forces but in real life attractive forces and repulsive forces will change the pressures of that container. And our ideal gas law does not account for this at all. And so we need to be able to kind of understand these exceptions. Yeah. And they're, they're actually, if you think about it, a lot of the exceptions are related to temperature and similar to like understanding um, the relationship between the, like how many collisions with the wall and pressure, still important to understand that relationship between speed and temperature. Um, and we talked about, right, that higher temperature moves faster, lower temperature moves slower. But when we're at a given temperature, the ideal gas law assumes that everything is moving at the same speed, right? Like it has the same kinetic energy. Average, and yeah. So, yeah, the same mm -hmm. average kinetic energy. And so that's why we can make the generalized statement that higher temperature they are, on average, all moving faster. Lower temperature, they are, on average, all moving slower. If you think about it, if some of the gases are moving super, super, super fast, um, and then just a few, you know, a few are moving very slow, they're going to have very different interactions, right? Um, whereas if they're all moving about the same speed, then they're all going to have about the same type of interactions with one another. And so this is what makes it like helpful to to have this as part of the ideal gas law. The other thing is if we say, oh, well, hydrogen moves like Speedy Gonzalez, right? But, um, you know, bromine, just because it's up here, <laughs> bromine is like very, you know, very slow to move, then the ideal gas law would not be applicable to all of the gases, right? It would have to be different and adjusted for every single gas. And that's not what we do. And so for the ideal gas law, we also assume that that average kinetic energy at a given temperature is independent of what gas we're working with. And so this is what allows us to apply the ideal gas law to gases in general. Yeah. Um, I do, I do want to take a second, like since we've kind of touched on like different elements, right? Like Hydrogen gas and bromine gas, both diatomic, in case you uh, were wondering, um, those like at the same temperature are going to have the same kinetic energy, but like kinetic energy is mass times velocity squared. And so hydrogen, because it's so much lighter, so it's got a much smaller mass in order to have the same kinetic energy as bromine, it's going to have a higher velocity. And so the velocity goes up. And so hydrogen and should actually be moving faster than bromine at a given temperature. But if we think about like pressures, right? Like like uh, uh, a hydrogen, which is like a ping pong ball, really light. If that's hitting the wall, but it's going faster, right? So, so it's hitting that, but it's lighter. That's different than like a bowling ball hitting the wall, but it's going slower. And so in theory, the pressures shouldn't actually change even though their velocities are different because like the things that are lighter go faster. The things that are heavier go slower, but actually the pressure doesn't actually change in this case. Um, Thank you for picking that up. I think it's helpful to remember, and I think this is where um, your comment kind of reminded me of this. The One of the earlier premises that we talked about was that uh, energy is conserved. And so with saying that they all have the same average kinetic energy allows us to conserve that energy that we talked about earlier. And that ties back in with the elasticity 
of collisions, right? We're not losing energy. We're not deforming anything when these gas molecules are colliding with one another. Um, so this is also where the different uh, premises interact with one another and, and play because you have to have all of them in order for the ideal gas law to, to apply. Um, the other... The other one that is related to what we've talked about is that these gases are not moving in a specific um, predetermined um, direction, right? Their motion is random. Um, so in the example that I gave with people running to class, it's a little artificial, right? Because you are headed somewhere. But a better example for just the the randomness of the motion is everyone is just running around crazy. The fire alarm went off. No one has actually done a drill. No one knows where the exits are. Mm -hmm. Everyone's just kind of running and doing their thing. Um, and then maybe, you know, you see your ex or you see your friend. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you're you're slowing down or you're you're moving in, in the other. Um, you're running towards them. Or you're moving away from them. Um, but yeah, the analogy is can be modified. For, yeah. for understanding the randomness of motion. I think I think the MCAT really likes, I think most students who go through undergrad are actually pretty comfortable with the ideal gas law and the ideal gas equation. And so the reason we're talking about so much about these assumptions, like we're like, oh, we're going to talk about ideal gas. And we've been spending the whole time talking about the assumptions that we're making and why they're wrong. The reason for that is because most students are pretty comfortable with this. And so the MCAT doesn't like to test as much, though, like straight up simple, like it's just a plug and chug ideal gassing. Like they they kind of, that's not the, the goal for that um, because they need to separate people. If they ask a question and everyone gets it, then the MCAT like finds that question useless because the whole point of the MCAT is to try to separate people. Um, and so they like to ask a lot about these exceptions, right? They like to ask a lot about that kind of overall. So they could ask you a question about like, okay, we have two samples of gas at the same temperature and the same volume. And we have one mole of nitrogen gas and we have one mole of argon gas. Which one's like, what's going to, is there going to be a difference in their pressures in the real world? And yeah, there kind of is because argon's bigger and like, so that whole assumption of like, oh, these things have no volume, like that's a bigger assumption for argon because argon's bigger than neon. Neon is smaller. And so pretending that it's small is like doesn't change much with with neon, but pretending that argon's small, that that's a little bit different because argon's a little bit bigger. And you could do like an even bigger molecule. You could do like cholesterol, right? Like if you somehow made that a gas, right? That's a really big molecule. Um but they can ask you questions of like, oh, of all of these different gases, what's going to happen to the the pressures, right? And so in te technically, because argon's bigger, it's going to be taking up more space and hitting the walls a little bit more because there's just less space to move around inside because argon is taking up some of that space. And so the pressure for argon will be higher than the pressure for neon. Or they could say, okay, we have that neon gas, and then you also have ionized neon, and that's what's happening in like neon lights, like in the the strip in um, Las Vegas. I don't think any of them actually use neon lights anymore. It's all LEDs because it's cheaper. But um, when it, whenever you make uh, neon lights, like you create ionized neon in there, and so all the neon is going to have I think the negative charge um, in that case, and so. What's that going to do to the pressures, right? Is the pressure inside that tube that's filled with neon, is that going to change when you turn it into an ion? Yeah. And like, that's a good question. Like that, I think the MCAT could and would ask, like what happens to the pressure inside that light bulb when the neon becomes ionized and it all becomes negatively charged? I kind of just want to wait and like ask for students to like think about this. Like what happens when it becomes all negative? How does that affect the pressure? they're all going to be repelling each other and which means they're going to be hitting the walls more. And so like the char, the, the pressure is going to go up because they're hitting the walls more. Um, so that's the repulsive thing. If they were attractive forces, like if they were things that had dipoles in them, like water, like those stick together really well. And so water is going to have a lower pressure as a gas than we think it should because they're all attractive to each other. And so that changes things there. Um, and so the MCAT really likes to ask about those sort of exceptions, right? Like, like not just a straight plug and chug, but understanding how this works overall. 
Now, there is actually an equation that incorporates all this. Um, it's called the Van der Waals equation, and it is a little bit scary. <laughs> it's a little bit, a um, little bit of a mess. Um, so the ideal gas law is PV equals NRT. I feel like we probably should have started with that at some point, but like the pressure, <laughs> yeah, times the volume is equal to N, which is the number of moles, times R, which is Rydberg's constant, and T, which is temperature. So it's this relationship between pressure, volume, moles, and temperature. Um, but so if the if the real or if the ideal equation is PV equals NRT, there's a guy Van der Waals who came up with the Van der Waals equation, and so we need to be able to like modify the volume component, right? Because the volume components, like there's actually something weird going on there. And we also need to modify the pressure component, which has to do with the like, are we hitting the walls more or less because of the attractive forces between the molecules? And so like in the equation, all of a sudden, instead of PV equals NRT, there's P, but there, we do something to it, right? So it's actually pressure plus A over a n squared over v squared, um, where n is the um, n is the like number of moles. I think v is uh, the the volume in there. It's the same volume as the other volume in that equation. Um, and then you know, a is some like constant depending on the gas, right? Because there's there's got to be differences between neon ionized and neon not ionized. And so a in that equation is going to be something related to like the attractive and repulsive forces. Now, to be clear, I don't think they're going to ask you to do a big plug and chug calculation with this, but they might ask you what would what is that A going to be in the in the case of the ionized neon? Is that going to be a positive or a negative? Because it can change, right? Depending on attractive versus repulsive forces. And so like asking you to kind of understand the equation, how to use it is big. So we, we modify that pressure component with pressure plus a n squared over v squared instead of just p, right? The volume we also have to modify. Instead of just volume, we need to incorporate the, the volume of the gases themselves. And so the v component becomes v minus n b, where n is the number of moles and b is the volume of the actual gases, like a, like, like you subtract that out of the equation to pretend that there's there's not that actual volume inherent in this. And so you have V equals N, V minus NB that you plug that in just for V in the equation. So instead of PV equals NRT, it's P plus AN squared over V squared. Take that times V minus NB equals NRT. And so we're just modifying that ideal gas equation, all of a sudden starting to pay, attack, pay attention to the attractive and repulsive forces and how that affects the pressure and the volume of the individual atoms and how that affects the volume overall. Yeah, it's it's nice to have something that represents real world. Um, but, you know, we're not all chemists and physicists and, you know, biologists. And so you understanding the concepts is going to be the single most important thing you can do for yourself on test day. Um, and like yeah. you were saying, you know, there's nothing, you're not going to get something super crazy wild out of left field, you know, like in these wild numbers. But if you understand the concepts, you can see how, if they, you know, give you a value, what direction would it move in? Um, and you can, do that, you know, even without having to sit down with a calculator, which you will not have on test day in case you didn't know this. Um, but understanding the concepts and the way that the, the what they're going to test you on relates to other topics that you've seen is going to be one of the most important things you can you can do to set yourself up for success on the MCAT. Yeah. I, th I feel like probably everyone panicked a little bit when I was like going in deep into that equation. Um, but the MCATs, I, I, I say this all the time, and I mean it. The MCAT is not a math test. They're not trying to find the best mathematicians and then make them do surgery. Like, that is not the goal of the AAMC, right? They want, but they do want to know that you understand the concepts behind these. And so you're, I don't think it's very likely for you to get a big plug and chug with this equation. Um, and if they do, they're probably going to give you the equation. But they might ask you something about like 
like the neon example that we talked about, like neon gas when ionized, how, how does that affect the pressure? Like that's straight up something they could ask. And you should expect to be able to be, uh, you should expect to be able to deal with these like scenarios, like all of a sudden these things are repelling each other or attracting each other or the atoms are bigger or smaller. Like how does that affect the ideal gas law? Yeah. And taking a step back, because now we've talked about a lot about exceptions. We've talked about, you know, how we account for those exceptions. There are variations of the ideal gas law that you are also supposed to know. And so um, the two that we're going to talk about today are going to be uh, Charles and Boyle's law. And the idea behind all of these kind of special scenarios are all based off the original equation. And all you're doing is you're assuming that anything not in this new, this new, so to speak, law is held constant. So in the case of Boyle's law, all the only thing that we're assuming that's changing is pressure and volume. We are assuming that the moles of gas are staying the same. We're also assuming that the temperature stays the same. Now, we've actually talked about this a little bit, and so it should not feel super uncomfortable. We've talked about pressure and volume. Um, what happens, right, if we make the volume smaller? If we decrease the volume, we're going to increase the pressure, right? There is a smaller volume, and so these tennis balls that are whizzing around are going to be hitting the um, the walls of the, the container um, more often, right? There's going to be an increased pressure. Whereas if I, you know, blow up a balloon, right? And it has this giant volume, the pressure is going to be smaller because these, um, I was gonna say particles, not particles, the the gases, the tennis balls, the pinpoint, yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, the pinpoints have all this extra space that they will travel before they hit the um, the wall. So again, I used people to understand this. The way I thought about this is you have a small classroom, right? And you shove 30 people in that classroom. They will all feel each other. There will be people pushing up against the, <laughs> the outer edges of this classroom and people are not going to be happy. So it's a tiny volume and a whole lot of pressure. Whereas if you move these same 30 people into, I'll use gym, I'll use the gym again, um, everybody's spread out. And so as individuals, they're not going to feel the pressure, but nobody's pushed up against the wall, right? They have that extra space. And so they feel less pressure. And again, this is not a perfect analogy, but it was the way my brain um, conceptualized no. this. I, I like that. I, I like I want to pretend that it's a bunch of like five year olds that are running around chaotically. <laughs> right. Like it's random motion. It's just like crazy. And like if you have a gymnasium like and you're just measuring, they're all running around randomly and they're all like hitting walls. Like how often are they actually hitting walls in this gymnasium with like 10 like five year olds in there? And like, it's not actually that often because it's a really big space. But if I shrink that to a smaller space, like a classroom, and they're all running around slamming into the walls and shoving and pushing, like they're going to be hitting the walls way more often because the volume shrank. And so even though it's the same number of kids it's this, and they're running at the same speed, we didn't change that. So we didn't change temperature because that's what temperature is, is like how quickly they're moving. So the temperature didn't change, the number of individuals didn't change, which is in the number of moles of actual the gas. But like the smaller volume means they're hitting the walls more often and a bigger volume means they're hitting the walls less often. So I guess pressure goes up, volume goes down and vice versa, whereas volume goes up, pressure goes down. And um, like that's a good way to kind of just like visualize this. Like pressure is how often are they slamming into the walls? Volume is the size of the room. Temperature is how fast are they running? Obviously all of these and like N is like the number of kids in that room. You put more kids in there. They're going to be hitting the walls more. The pressure is going to go up. And so a lot of this you can kind of put together. But Boyle's Law is, a spe is especially this just pressure volume. We just imagine like, oh, smaller room. What happens to how often they're hitting the walls? And like bigger room. How often are they hitting the walls? Toddlers running around and recess are the reason we need nurses in school. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Elementary <That's>, schools. <laughs> yeah, um, this, this, yeah, this is probably not the ideal classroom environment. But, um, <laughs> but maybe I think that helps illustrate the point, right? And I think that's like at the end of the day, that's what you want to make sure that, you know, you get it. You can um, conceptualize it. Exactly. And so cool. 
Right. Boyle's law. It's it's an inverse relationship between pressure and volume. Charles law. Now what we're assuming stays constant is the pressure. So now pressure um, and of course, moles, right? Number of of um, number of moles um, uh, stay the same. I don't know why that was so hard to come out, like why that was so difficult to say. But the volume and the temperature are changing. So think about a balloon right on a hot day versus a balloon on a cold day on a hot day that balloon's going to be a little bit bigger right whereas on a cold day it's going to shrink a little bit i don't know if you guys have seen like balloons when it's a cold outside it's a little weird um, and just like watching the the size change i i've lived in um like the south most of my life so i'm used to very humid hot environments and i have to keep reminding myself you can't include anything that accounts for humidity that's a whole other topic yeah um, but if you think about it right the the volume has to change in response to the temperature because the volume is affecting um the speed at which these molecules are moving and so if you keep the pressure the same when you increase the speed you have to increase the volume as well um so unlike pressure and volume, which have an inverse relationship. Volume and temperature have a proportional relationship. I think something else that can be really helpful to determine the direction of the relationship is picture the actual equation in your head, right? Uh, it's PV, right? Pressure and volume equals NRT, moles, Rydberg's constant temperature. So in order for us to have the same before and after, pressure and volume are on the same side of the equation. They have to move in opposite directions. But volume and temperature are on opposite sides of the equation. And so they have to move in the same direction. And I think that's actually something that's helpful for math in general yeah, to remember. For all equations, right. <laughs> exactly. Um, but it was something that I personally found especially helpful when I was thinking about these relationships because that underlying idea of if they're on the same side, they move in opposite, opposites, uh, you know, different sides of the equation, they move in the same direction. That helped me understand like what direction these, um, these different uh, characteristics have to move in order for the before and the after to stay the same. And therefore for everything to remain, uh, for everything else to remain constant. Yeah. I, um, <laughs> so first off, the way I learned Charles Law is um, the person who taught it to me was like, oh, you know, like Charles in Charge, the TV show and like Charles and like TV. And I'm like, listen, what? I know that I'm older than probably all of you guys listening, <laughs> but that was old for me. And I'm like, <laughs> like that was that was definitely like that was like 70s, I think, uh, that TV show. But for some reason that has stuck in my head. I think it's because <laughs> I'm just like why was that the example they did? Like, that's the weirdest example um, to use. But now I always remember that Charles is TV, temperature and volume, because um, Charles was on TV and Charles in charge. I'm like, I, I've i never seen the show. Um, I didn't even know it was a show until that example was said to me. But um, there you go. I had the same face you did as I, where you're like, what? <laughs> um, and like, that just like <laughs> stuck in my head. So Charles is temperature and volume. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but to kind of like conceptualize this, like at the gas level, like I, I like the example of a balloon, right? Because in a balloon, there's pressure from outside the balloon. There's air slamming into the wall with that balloon, kind of pushing it in. And like if we increase the pressure outside, that will shrink the balloon, right? And if we make the pressure outside less, then the stuff pushing in won't be pushing in as much. And so it'll expand because there's also pressure inside the balloon, right? So the stuff inside the balloon, the air is like whizzing around there. And so if that is moving faster, that's going to hit the walls harder and that's going to make it expand. And if it's moving slower, it's going to be hit the, hitting the walls less and it's going to contract. And so that's what determines the size of a balloon is this balance of pressure outside versus pressure inside. And so if the pressure inside, if you raise the temperature, like the volume will go up. And so a hot balloon will actually um, will actually expand and a cold balloon will shrink. Um, but what's also interesting is those things will change, like a balloon can change size, even if you don't change anything in the balloon, but you just change the stuff outside the balloon. So if you take like a balloon and you drive up into the mountains, like the pressure inside didn't change 
but the pressure outside dropped. And so the balloon is going to expand when you drive up into the mountain. Um, this is actually something you can do as an experiment, and I encourage you to because it's fun. Um, but you, if you're ever driving into the mountains, um, I have a brother who lives in Denver, and so often I'll like take a road trip um, to go visit him. And I always like to buy a bag of chips and then just set it on the dash. And then as I drive, I see it like... Like it, it's all, you know, it's like not fully inflated, but like as you drive up, it like inflates until the point where it's like, I feel like it's going to pop, right? Like this balloon, or this, this thing is going to pop. It hasn't yet, but one day it will pop. <laughs> um, and so that's, that's a thing you can actually like see, like with like changing the pressure outside will change the inflation of the balloon, otherwise known as bag of Doritos. Um, <laughs> but um, that's just my little fun science experiment as I visit my brother. The one, so I, I kind of want to know why Doritos specifically, but anyway. Um, it's just my least, favorite, so. <laughs> Which flavor, though? That's the real question. Oh, Cool Ranch, all the way. <laughs> oh, okay. I was more of a nacho cheese person. Um, but I think that I, I I like coming up with, like, silly examples. The one the one I always think about that I wanted to use, but then I realized I can't because it factors in humidity, was actually hair. So... <laughs> On, on hot days, I don't know about you guys, but for me, my hair just gets super poofy. <laughs> and yes, part of that's going to be humidity. But I think even independent of the humidity, like just in the same area, um, when it's a hotter day, it's just bigger. And then <laughs> on, on cooler days, it behaves a little bit better. Um, but I, I know what day is going to be a good hair day based on the temperature and, of course, the humidity. But it's just, it's the little things that you can pick up on. One thing that I really want to, like, just do an experiment on, but obviously can't do, is when you have a fever, like, what happens in your lungs, you know? Um, yeah. I and, feel like, like just in the, in the solubility of, like, the gases in your body, Um at different yeah. temperatures, like when you have a fever versus hypothermia versus at your normal temperature, but obviously not going to do any experiments with that. Yeah. Just a thought experiment, you know? Yeah, no, that's super interesting. I mean, there's also stuff with like when gases heat up, they expand. And so like if I need so much oxygen to survive, right, if I'm breathing hot air, like any like breath full of air has actually got less stuff in it because... Like it expands like when you heat it up. So like if it's the same amount of oxygen, but it's just in a bigger volume because you heated up the air, then I take a deep breath. And like because the air is so what's the opposite of dense? So because the air is so less dense now that you've heated it up and it's expanded, you're actually getting in less oxygen in that. So um, there's a lot of factors going into this, but that's one of the reasons that I one of the reasons that I feel like when it is hotter, it's like I have a harder time breathing just overall. Um, and it might just be because there's actually just less oxygen in those breaths coming in. Um, well, you know, kind of like talking about that just like solubility thing, because th there's also a weird thing there. And this this isn't an ideal gas law thing, but because it's fun and interesting, um, I want to talk about it. <laughs> um, so gases will dissolve in liquids, right? So there's oxygen gas in water, right? Just like there's oxygen gas in our blood and carbon dioxide gas in our blood, like gases dissolve in liquids overall. Um, and temperature affects this. So you can kind of like think about like temperature, like is just things kind of jiggling around. Um, and that's true for, for solids and liquids also. It's not just gases. It's just gases are moving so fast that they bounce off the ceiling and everywhere. Liquids, like they're not going fast enough to go into the air. They're just kind of like wiggling around like in a puddle. Um, and solids are wiggling around, but they're all kind of holding hands. And so they're like wiggling overall, but they're not actually like moving in large ways. They're just kind of jiggling more than and whizzing around. Um, but like when you increase the temperature of, of water, right, that things move around faster. And so um, I always like to imagine, so gases in general are lighter than liquids, right? G and generally speaking. Um, so you can take like a way to visualize this is you could have like a bucket that you've have filled with golf balls, and you've also filled it with ping pong balls. 
And the golf balls, you've all painted blue for some reason. So it's like water. And so the, the golf balls are blue and the, the air or the golf balls are blue and they're the water. And the air or oxygen or carbon dioxide or whatever the gas is, that's the ping pong balls and they're lighter. And so you could mix this all around, right? Like you could reach in and like swirl them all up. So you have the golf balls and the ping pong balls all mixed together. But if you start to take that bucket and you shake it, right? And note that that's what's happening when you have warmer water, right? Like it's shaking more. And so if you take that and you start to shake it, if you shake it, what'll happen is the golf balls will go to the bottom and the ping pong balls will go to the top, right? Because the golf balls are heavier than the ping pong balls. And the more you shake it, the faster that's going to happen, right? So that's actually what's happening in water with gases. Like there's gases that are going into the water, but the warmer the water is, the more the water molecules are whizzing around, that gives the, the gas molecules more time to come to the top or makes it easier to get to the top. So the warmer water is, the less gas it will hold. And so if someone had a fever, in theory, their blood is going to be able to hold less oxygen and less carbon dioxide. Um, this is something we actually see a lot here. It's like the thick of the summer here in Missouri. Um, this is something we actually see with um, fish. So fish actually breathe air. I know everyone's like, wait, what? No, like fish, fish do breathe gases. It's just they breathe gaseous oxygen that's dissolved in the water. So like the ping pong balls in our pile of, of golf balls. And so like fish actually breathe air. They just breathe the air in the water, which is silly and um, kind of hard to wrap your mind around at first. But as you heat up that water, the, the air leaves the water. And so um, this is this is why if you have a fish tank, you have to have an aerator. You have to have something that's like blowing bubbles into your water because otherwise the fish don't have any oxygen in the water. Um, so that's why aerators are important for those of you who have aquariums. Um, but in the summer, right, like in at the end of uh, July and in August, the water is so hot, especially in those shallow ponds where it's like just a layer on top and the sun beats down, it heats up so that there's actually less gas, there's less oxygen in the water. And so fish suffocate, like they actually like suffocate and die because there's not enough oxygen in the water because the water got too warm. Um, there's actually, I know there's like big heat waves kind of going up everywhere right now. This is actually one of the interesting things with global warming is that like it can cause fish to suffocate in ponds and lakes. It's also just side note. If you think about like what fish need, my family does a lot of fishing. I don't know if you can tell. Um, if, if you think about what fish like are the most active fish, right? Things like bass and salmon and trout and pike, right? Like those fish that are like really active, they, they're going to need more oxygen, right? Because they like they need oxygen for their mitochondria to make ATP just like we do, right? And so the more active you are, the more oxygen you need, right? That's why when you run, you like breathe heavier. So same thing with these fish. The, the more active they are, the more oxygen they need. So they're actually in more danger than a lot of other fish in these cases um, for like having less oxygen. But also that's why you only find those fish in cold water, right? That's something that always, like I would really like salmon and always made me sad. I mean, I'm really far from the ocean. I live in Missouri. But um, it made me sad that like, I'm like, why are fish, why are salmon not in like the Carolinas, and in the like Florida and in like the coast of Texas and like Southern California, like why is there no salmon there? It's because salmon need a lot of oxygen to swim upstream. So they can only do that in cold water. So that's why we see salmon in like Alaska and Washington and Oregon um, and like, you know, like the, the colder Atlantic places, um, but you don't see them in warmer places. So you'll never see salmon swimming upstream in Mexico, but you will see them in Canada um, because the water is cold enough that they can get enough oxygen to actually swim upstream. Um, if they tried that in Mexico, they would suffocate because there's just not enough oxygen there. It's a little sad that fish are suffocating. But <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there, there's there's a lot of stuff 
going on with global warming just as a side note i mean this i don't mean this to be a a you know getting on a soapbox thing but like there's a lot of other stuff like carbon dioxide which is one of the main like contributors to global warming when that mixes with water that makes carbonic acid that's the same thing going on in our blood and so the like global warming the added additional co2 that's causing global warming and the warmer like world means that fish have less oxygen in their water and the water is becoming more acidic um and so that's like kind of a bad combo for definitely fish but like you know fish can move to colder water because like they could go north or south and so especially ocean fish land fish land fish is not a thing but like freshwater fish they have more difficulty with that um but what's even worse is like coral and things like that like if the water becomes more acidic they can't just go north or if they just need more oxygen they can't just go north because they're coral um and so that's also kind of an interesting thing with like killing off coral reefs and stuff like that with the acidification and changes in gas solubility in the water um that got real dense and real heavy all of a sudden um maybe this is just a moment to take a second and step back and be like chemistry is not just the class that you hated right like this is helps you kind of understand what's going on with you know like why like why there are dead fish in my pond right like why like salmon are found in the north but not in the south right that's a chemistry thing um but also kind of like what's going on in like blood and solubility and like i know everyone here is interested in medicine and so understanding this is really important um and like understanding like how we breathe um understanding like what's going on with pressures all around um just a side note um like that issue with like balloons and like pressures as you go like, go to different altitudes like that that bag of chips that inflates as you go up there's there's other issues with that with like scuba diving like when people get the bends right that's like gas with with high pressure that shoves the gas into the water and then if you go up really quickly the gas will come out of the water and if the water is your blood all of a sudden you just create a whole bunch of bubbles in your blood and that can kill you. And so that's why like surfacing really quickly in when you're scuba diving can can actually kill you because the pressure shoves a lot of gases into your blood. And then you go up, it's lower pressure, the gases come out of your blood. And like if that's in your hands and arms and legs and like your heart and your brain, like that's a problem if all of a sudden you got bubbles everywhere in your blood. Um, so this stuff is actually important maybe maybe that's the the big takeaway is like we need to understand these things so that we can apply them in the real world the jack weston podcast the only place you can come to learn about ideal gas law and leave knowing about fish the bends <laughs> and the ideal gas law um, yeah but we you know we we enjoy what we do and and we try and make the mcat engaging so it's not a chore um, but there are so many products, uh, free products and um, paid products on the Jack Weston MCAT, uh, the Jack Weston website. Um, we encourage you guys to take a look. If there are topics that we haven't covered yet that you're interested in learning more about, go to the AMC content outline. If you're listening to this and you're like, hmm, maybe I should start thinking about when I'm going to test and you haven't actually picked a date or maybe you're um, going to be applying next cycle or something like that. Chat with our academic advisors. They're fantastic. They are a free resource available to everyone, as is the AMC outline, um, the content outline on the website. And then, of course, we have our free trial sessions. We encourage you guys to go check those out and learn not just for the MCAT, but learn learn for the sake of learning these things. You may not get another chance to enjoy the process the way you you have now so thank you for joining us and see you next time